Well, I'm, I'm really excited uh, that we get to hear from Ryan Carlin today. Uh, he is professor of political science at Georgia State University, uh, where he's also the director of the Center for Human Rights and Democracy. Uh, Professor Carlin is a specialist in Latin American politics. In fact, uh, we were reflecting today that uh, his first big experience in Latin America was on a study abroad program in college in Chile, and uh, kept him going. And he's done field work in places like Argentina and in Colombia. Um, and as his career has evolved, he's um, broadened a lot of the questions that he's been asking in Latin America to other countries around the world as well. Um, he's been involved with a, a major social science project called the Executive Approval Project, uh, which collects and examines data on the approval ratings of government leaders. Um, he specializes uh, in his research on public opinion, on populism, and on questions of democratic legitimacy. Um, and once again, uh, he'll be speaking today on the popularity of the powerful leader approval ratings and the health of democracy. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Ryan Carlin to BYU. Thank you very much, Quinn, for the kind invitation and introduction. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you. It's also a little daunting uh, to give a, a public talk, um, and, uh, but I don't feel like I could t give a public talk on anything uh, besides this topic. I, um, as Professor Meacham, Meacham men mentioned, um, we started this thing called the Executive Approval Project in order to collect data on presidential and prime ministerial approval around the world. At the time, nobody had looked at presidential or prime ministerial approval beyond really the United States. Executive approval was basically an American politics game. And so in order to study it in a comparative way, it took a massive data collection effort, and that data collection effort is ongoing. And along the way, as you do in your academic career, you write a number of papers, you have a number of inter interesting discussions with people like you, and you think of other questions to answer. And today I want to share with you some of the questions that have motivated me uh, and have, uh, I think, generated some interesting answers that you can take with you going forward. And so we're going to start with a pop quiz today. Um, what is Joe Biden's approval rating? And I want to see a show of hands. I just see someone said like this. Yes. <laughs> well, could you be more specific? Just take a guess. And, I, and don't look it up. Don't look it up. I bet we can get close to it. What do you think? 42. 42. I hear 42. We got 48. 42? 42? 37. Ooh. Anybody want to go lower than 37? 38.1. And I'm going to show you that. Now, that is based on 538's average. 538 can present that average with some degree of confidence because in the United States of America, there is only one way to ask about presidential approval, and that is an old Gallup question that is, how satisfied, or how, do you approve or disapprove of the way the president is handling his job? And that question has been asked basically the same way since the early 40s in the United States, since the late 30s in the UK. Uh, but when you go outside of the United States, they ask the question a million different ways, and that's why we created the Executive Approval Project. Uh, but I won't get into that too much, but some of the data you're going to see today is based on our estimates of approval based on a range of different uh, of questions in, in, in context. Now, is 38.1 high or low? This is probably the right answer. But is, does it mean anything about Joe Biden as a president? Can it tell us anything about our state of our democracy, how well it's working? This talk should hopefully uh, drive home a simple plea, which is that you should pay attention to presidential approval rating or prime minister approval rating if you care about politics in a given country. Um, you might naturally push back and say, well, why should I? Well, I almost named this talk Presidential approval ratings, the only data point you need to know. Uh, I thought that was a little bit much, but that's kind of what I want to, I want to tell you. And, and you also might say, well, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a pollster. How can I make heads or tails of approval ratings? Um, what moves approval ratings? Does it change over time? And how can I know? 
And then finally, can we learn anything about democratic health by just knowing a president or a prime minister's approval rating? And as a kind of a guiding, uh, you know, for the why should I focus on this, I want to kind of make the point that presidential pr approval is kind of like a barometer. Now, I'm not, I don't know that much about meteorology, but when the barometer goes up, you're going to be over here in the fair and dry uh, parts of the barometer. When the barometer goes down, you're going to get wet. And I want to say that for the most part, popularity has a similar functioning. When it goes up, you can expect pretty high stability. When it goes down, you might expect some instability. It's a bit like a political risk indicator uh, that I think um, it can, can be powerful. And we can talk about what happens when you get too much power, too much popularity as well. But popular presidents advance their policy agendas. Not everything, they don't get everything they want, but they have a better chance of making good on the promises that they put forth on the campaign trail. When a president is too weak, no one will listen to them. In fact, this prompted um, one of my mentors, a guy by the name of James, Jim Stimson, to state in 1976 that if the, power, if the real power of the presidency is not directly proportional to the most recent Gallup for popularity rating, it's not far from it. And he goes on in that paragraph to say, if it gets too low, you can't take meetings in Washington. People won't come meet with you. They want to stay away. Even people in your own party might distance themselves from you. And as we've gone beyond the United States in this project, we've learned that that's basically true other places. So if you want to know whether or not whoever gets elected next time around is going to have any chance of passing their agenda, see how popular they are, at least in their first six months. A, in other places where you need to make big reforms, popularity is absolutely critical. Here are two uh, Argentine presidents. This guy here with the massive lamb chops is a guy whose face got cut off. This is a guy by the name of Carlos Menem. When Carlos Menem came to power, he told everybody he was going to go uh, champion the status quo, and he was going to thumb his nose at Washington, uh, even though Washington said he needed to make a lot of reforms. But when he gets into office, he is widely popular and is able to push through very difficult economic reforms. And in the background is a, is a, is a, uh, is a sign saying, you know, something jingoistic about a, a country that doesn't control its natural resources and transportation, you know, is basically giving up its sovereignty. And, and here is President Menem privatizing all of these things. Uh, and that was a huge sea change in Argentine politics. And today, uh, the current uh, president that, that's just been elected, he's now in office for a couple of months. His name is Javier Millet. He comes in, he's trying to make massive changes, but he is not popular. And in fact, here he is pleading with, uh, with, with you know, this is the quote on the news, right? He's like, hey, I won the election saying that I was going to have to make adjustments. Why aren't you letting me make adjustments? You voted for me. And he's very frustrated. And so if you, if you want to get something big done, you, you better be popular. This is a, uh, a graph that kind of tells a, a simple story about government stability, and by government, I mean cabinets. This, uh, this line right here that goes down is showing about the 18-month mark. That's about the average length that a, that a cabinet in, in Latin America lasts without having a, a shift of ministers or someone gets, gets kicked out. And by country, these, these cabinet, uh, uh, by, by presidencies, these cabinets can, can last a, a, a whole lot, um, a, a great ver a variety of, of lengths. So under Lula in Brazil, the chances of, uh, of your cabinet surviving about 18 months is about 75%. Uh, in Ecuador, this is a, a President uh, Noboa from the, from the 2000s shows that the chances of him lasting 18 months is about 50%, and in Peru, the chances that you, your cabinet is going to last 18 months is, is, is less than, a, is less than uh, one in five, right? So popularity makes you stable. You can, you, can, uh, you can govern more easily. You don't have to always constantly wrangle your coalition partners. When you're popular, you can govern and get things done. Popular presidents are less likely to be impeached and they're less likely to be removed. Need we remind you of Monica Lewinsky? You guys don't remember Monica Lewinsky. You may have heard of her, but she got, uh, well, President Clinton got in trouble 
uh, and, and was not, he was impeached, but not removed. He was very popular at the time. We were living through what I call the good old days. When I was sitting in your seat, President Clinton was the president. Everything was great with the world. America was on top. Democracy was thriving, and he could withstand basically anything. Uh, and then here on the right-hand side, we have President Dilma Rousseff of Brazil, who gets impeached on kind of an accounting technicality, if you really want to be honest with it. It wasn't legal, but it was, there was a lot of precedent for it in Brazil. And her popularity, we're going to actually show a graph of it here in a little bit, was really low. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't survive this and is booted out about two, two years into her, uh, her second term. Some places don't even bother with the formalities of impeachment. This is Argentina in 2001. Uh, on the top right, you see a helicopter fer uh, ferrying away President um, Fernando de la Rua from their version of the White House, which is called the Pink House. Um, and, uh, and over here on the right, you see some youths uh, uh, making trouble at the, at, at the main door of the, of the Casa Rosada, the pink house, and then here's the street scene, right? Uh, if, you can't, if you're not popular, you may not survive in office, and you might just be forced to leave uh, rather than, you know, kicked out by the Constitution. <coughs> Unpopular presidents may not be reelected. It's pretty rare for an incumbent to lose reelection. We've had some precedents for this. Uh, it's actually pretty rare in Latin America as well, where, where it has, has the bulk of the world's presidential systems. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not impossible, and we might see the reverse here uh, of these numbers coming up if Biden doesn't get his approval ratings up. And by definition, popular prime ministers are able to retain parliament confidence uh, better, right? Um, here's a picture. Uh, this is the... This is Mariano Rajoy. He was voted out with a no-confidence vote after uh, overseeing a very difficult time in Spanish politics. They're clapping for him, uh, I think, as sort of you know, a nice way to say thank you, but you're, but you're out of here still. Um, in parliamentary systems, again, but kind of by definition, they, the prime minister serves at the confidence of the government. So when the public doesn't like him, it's easier for uh, the parliament to turn against him and then therefore... Uh, a prime minister has to go. I don't know what I'm pointing at, but it's not going. Oh, and then finally, the flip side of this is very popular prime ministers can serve forever. This is Angela Merkel, who, uh, who set a record for service as chancellor of Germany in a place where that's known for having long-serving prime ministers like Conrad Adenauer, Willy Brandt, and so forth. Um, and, and she was basically popular the entire time. So to see what she got done in her lifetime compared to what, what, others, uh, what others who weren't as popular got done is really quite striking. So how popular is Joe Biden or any executive? I gave you the, 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 the heads up that it was 38.1. He's 36.3. Disapprove. Okay. But I want to show you how to make sense of this. Is that a lot? Is that a little? Of course, it's all relative but it's all relative to some very basic things. And I want to walk you through those relativities so that, you, so that in two months you go look at Biden's approval again and you can get a sense of whether or not things are going well or not. So this is an early graph from that uh, Jim Stimson article in 1976, the year I was born, and it shows one of the first times we get to see executive approval uh, graphed out linearly or I mean, on a sort of XY axis. And you'll notice a couple of things. Now, this data starts with Truman. It goes to the end of Johnson's second term. Um, and and, and here, here's what we have. Uh, there, there are kind of some very basic patterns in these data. First of all, you will see there's a honeymoon period. The honeymoon is that first initial moment. It, it, some people try to define how long it's going to last. In American politics, they say, is it six months? Is it nine months? Is it three months? And people like me say, well, it's as long as the graph looks like it's, it's lasting. And you can see, but for the most part, people start popular, uh, and then they become less popular. It turns out that it is costly to rule. Every time you make a decision in office, uh, you're, going to have to, you're, you're going to make someone mad. 
And maybe some of those people that you make mad were people that voted for you or supported you on a conditional basis, perhaps. Maybe they're independents that say, oh, no, I knew this person was going to go too far to the right or too far to the left, and they abandon you. Or maybe it's somebody in your own coalition or your own party that says, well, why did you go for health care first instead of immigration, right, or, or, you know, gay marriage or whatever you said you would do. Well, you didn't do that, right, so I'm going to abandon you now. And this just kind of goes down, 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 down over time. This is time on, uh, in years on our, X, on our X axis here. But many people become more popular as the end of their term approaches. Jim Stimson calls this about you know, the electoral cycle because elections are at either end. And if you are running for re-election, the press is all over you. Your campaign is doing nothing but telling about telling the public how good, how great of a job you have done as president. So you get a lot of that, you get to recoup that, 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 that winning coalition. It brings you back up in the numbers, and, and you're, you're doing everything you can to improve your image. If you're not running for re-election, you get to do these victory laps. You become a lame duck. Lame ducks don't do uh, anything. They can't get anything done. They have state of the unions. Everybody knows that they don't really mean much uh, because they're lame ducks. And... Uh, so they, they have fun, and they don't pick fights. They don't pick as many fights. They don't get as, as involved. So their numbers uh, go up. People start to like them. They seem more sympathetic. Okay, so this is the uh, approval. Basic patterns of approval, the, the dynamics of approval. And for the most part, these dynamics uh, are kind of stronger in your first term than in your second term. Very few people have a, a, a honeymoon uh, and most people are much less popular in their second terms. And we'll, we'll come back to this here. So is this just the United States? Is the United States strange somehow? Well, according to Jasper Johns, maybe so. But it turns out that this is a feature, not a bug, of presidential systems. It's also a feature, not a bug, of parliamentary systems. But here's a graph uh, that takes all of the American presidents th through uh, Barack Obama, and it puts them in those little white, white and black, uh, the little white and black part of the graph, and that's basically their approval ratings all kind of averaged together and summed together. Uh, and for the most part, American presidents are, uh, you know, they start around 55% approval, and they come down to around the mid, uh, the, uh, up, uh, the, like, uh, you know, 47 or something. That's on average. Now, there's a lot of variation there. That's what those um, confidence intervals are. Latin American presidents do basically the same thing. This is about 120 Latin American presidents, all kind of balled into one. And we can see that, in fact, they do basically the same thing. That maybe their dynamics are even more dramatic. But for the most part, you get a honeymoon, you get a cost of ruling, and then you get a little bump at the end of the election. If you put these uh, on a zero line where zero is average, and you just look at like whether or not you're above average for your country or below average, then these very much look the same. It's also true, as I kind of mentioned, that you don't typically get a second term honeymoon. This is a look, the, the small little dots here show your approval uh, outside, you know, after six months into your election to the end. And so is the, for, that's your baseline approval rating. It's basically on average for a bunch of these presidents and, uh, and prime ministers in around the mid 40s, right? Your first six months, you get a massive honeymoon, your first time elect, elected in both parliamentary and presidential regimes. But in both regimes, if you get reelected, you get a very small uh, honeymoon. This is your honey, the, the third little graph is your honeymoon the second time around. So it's just not that different. Everybody knows what you're all about. It's baked in. They know what they can expect of you. They don't have all the high hopes. People don't pour all of their dreams into you. They know what you're going to do uh, because they know you well. So the United States is not so strange. How popular is Biden? Well, let's also look throughout history in a given country. We can look across context uh, and, and, and think about what kinds of features of context may make presidents or prime ministers more or less popular, kind of on average. So in American history, 538.com has a nice graph that shows Biden's approval rating graphed on top of other presidents' approval ratings. So, um, Biden is 
a lot less popular on average than Richard Nixon. Um, about the same as Gerald Ford. About the same, almost exactly the same as Donald Trump, although you can see Biden got a slightly bigger honeymoon. Trump has no honeymoon. He starts out basically under 50 and stays there. Uh, Biden has like a brief six months where he's barely over 50, and then inevitably it's gone. You can see other features uh, in this graph that we're going to talk about coming up, but for the most part, you see more or less the, the cyclical dynamics. You have a very strange thing for George W. Bush. Everybody probably can guess what that big spike is, 9-11, uh, um, and we're going to come to that as well. But these cyclical effects, and you get a similar spike uh, for the invasion of Kuwait, um, Desert Storm here for his, his father, uh, but more or less, the cyclical dynamics on average kind of hold. So how popular is Biden? Well, he's not very popular in historical terms in the United States. How popular is he, and, and he's very much in Trump territory, okay? How popular is he compared to other people? Now, this is a graph that I don't expect you to read, but all of these red lines represent the beginning and ends of uh, presidential terms. I've made some simplifications because in some countries there are, there's a, a rapid succession of presidents. But these are people who were elected and that served. Uh, maybe not always to the end, but you can see that, that big pattern where I showed honeymoon and a dip and a, and, a, and a bump at the end, it's really averaging over a lot of variation among countries. But let's, let's look at some, some recent leaders, and we can kind of benchmark Biden compared to them. So Biden's at 38.1. The recent uh, pre the, the president of uh, El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, just got elected with uh, approval 44 months into his ter term in office. His approval was uh, 91.2. So even in comparison, of course, that's a lot compared to Biden, but compared to other Salvadoran presidents who actually were pretty popular in their own right, this puts him in the stratosphere. Okay, And he's in the stratosphere for everybody. No one can get 100%, but pretty much... Okay, let's go back to our good friend Javier Millet, newly elected president of Argentina. In historical perspective in Argentina, he's doing quite badly. This is, this is Menem's second term, so he doesn't get a, a re, a, 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 any honeymoon at all to speak of. And uh, here is um, Macri's first term. That's kind of where it ends. But very few, he, he has one of the weakest honeymoons in Argentine history. So how bad is it? It's not necessarily... 50% is some magic number, but historically, Argentines see this as a very weak president, and no wonder he is having trouble passing reforms. We have a brand new president taking over in Ecuador in very, very difficult conditions. He is highly supported. Uh, even, Ecuador, even in terms of Ecuador's uh, uh, fairly pre uh, popular presidents, he is quite popular at 81% approval, and he has big problems to deal with, including increasing... Uh, uh, levels of, of organized crime and drug, drug gangs. I don't know if anybody saw it recently. They had uh, a, drug, a drug gang come onto the, the news on the national news station and point a gun at the newscaster. Uh, it's, it's quite striking what's going on in Ecuador. So this guy's got a lot to, to get done, but he has a big honeymoon, and it, we'll see if he can do it, right? Okay, so I'm trying to give you some context here for our numbers. Let's talk about um, comparing any given leader, one question I want you to ask is, is this leader a prime minister or a president? I told you that more or less the dynamics are similar. And what this is going to show you, averaging over about 200 presidents uh, split over 22 parliamentary democracies and 21 presidential democracies, these dynamics are basically the same. But you can see that presidents have a much bigger honeymoon, yet they go way lower on average in, uh, in support than, well, maybe not way lower. I should say they, they do sink quite dramatically from their, from their peak at their honeymoon, and they fall um, about to the same level, I guess, as the average uh, prime minister. What's going on here? Well, we've been trying to understand this, and we think at least a couple of things are going on. First of all, presidents are, they are elected directly. You vote directly on a president. Our country is weird because we have the Electoral College in the middle, but most places vote directly for the president. 
And so that makes it more easy. It makes it, uh, they have incentives to become more personalist on the campaign trail. So people pour their, 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 their dreams and they, their Rorschach test of, of, of what, uh, you know, uh, can be in this new, uh, this new presidency on, on the incumbent president, on the incoming president. It's also true that parties are weaker and more fragmented in presidential systems. So that means that the president might be elected from a party that only maybe has 14% of uh, the vote in, in, in Congress, and maybe only 10% of people in the population identify with that party. Whereas in, in parliamentary systems, parties are pretty stable. You've got you know, very uh, deep roots in, in society, and so there's some built-in floors for prime ministers under which they're just not likely to sink just because of partisan, uh, partisan um, uh, uh, roots. So we think that that's kind of interesting. So a, if you see a prime minister that's at 50% approval, that's amazing. And if you see a prime minister like the current prime minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak, who's under 20, you should be very afraid. I mean, he's probably a toast, right? He's gone, right? So we've seen this with other UK prime ministers who get below 20. It's, it's not going to last very long. Okay. Well, if that was comparing apples to apples, let's compare a little bit, uh, apples to oranges. Let's compare a little bit of apples to kind of apples. And this is a look at male and female presidents. So another question you might ask yourself is, if when you're trying to decipher a given president's approval rating, is this a male or a female? Okay. Well, uh, if you look at the dynamics uh, of the male and the female presidents, some things are going to be pretty obvious to you. First of all, we have much higher uh, and much longer honeymoons for male leaders. Female leaders get in, and it's, they kind of immediately drop. They start out a little lower, and then they drop dramatically so. Uh, some of them may recover more at the end, but for the most part, it, they're, they're, they're unlikely to have as, uh, have as stable a support. And we think, we're not sure, we think that could be related to some of the gender stereotypes. Uh, presidents and executives are meant to have display agentic stereotypes. They're able to make decisions and, you know, uh, not care what anyone says, whereas sometimes female stereotypes tend to be communal. And so uh, they just have a mismatch with, with the role and, 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 uh, and, and, and the gender of the, of the leader. So, in fact, our research shows not only do you have these massive differences just in the dynamics, but when it comes to the extent to which the public punishes Male and female leaders for policy failures, it's quite dramatic. They, pun they punish them about the same for economic failures, but they punish female leaders far more for crime, for corruption, and for things like uh, domestic terrorism. And a lot of places where we have presidential uh, female presidents, we've had that, the Philippines, uh, Central America, um, and, and, and even Argentina has a, a low level of domestic terrorism. So uh, there is quite a double standard. Um, we're going to come back to this idea of, of the public punishing or rewarding here in a little bit. So if you learn nothing about this from this talk, you should ask yourself, okay, if, some, if someone asks how popular somebody is, you should ask yourself, where are we in the cycle? What term is this leader in? How popular our other leaders historically, if you look at Peru, it's all people in the, in the teens and the 20s, uh, and compared to whom, okay? Is it a female versus a male? Is it a prime minister, or par, uh, president, et cetera? Now you want to know what moves. In some ways, Jim Stimson, who wrote about this in the American context, he thought that nothing could move it. He basically thought he'd kind of discovered the law of gravity or something. Um, he says, you know, for the most part, presidents are bystanders at their own backsliding popularity. And so that's not, not actually true. There are a couple of things that do move presidential approval. And one of them is crises. And, and one of them, uh, the other big one is performance. We kind of already touched on that. But you don't have to be able to read Ukrainian to, uh, to understand that, that this could be uh, what's considered a rally around the flag event. Now, on the green line, you have Zelensky's approval rating. He comes in not very popular. I think, I think he has a phone call with Trump and becomes more popular. Um, and then he slides down for a while. You, the, the normal laws of gravity kick in. And then all of a sudden, there's a buildup on his border. And it's looking like war is coming. And then it comes. And then he goes, boom. And then that, that spike is about the same size as what we get in 9-11. Uh, in, um, in 
Rallies uh, happen because there's a national threat, an existential threat to the nation. It generates a lot of emotions, most of them negative. Fear, anger, often uh, tend to make people cling to uh, the, 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 elect the, the political system itself. This is a, a theory called system justification theory. It also makes people cling to their in-group. We're Americans. We're not re Republicans or Democrats. We're Americans. Or we're not, you know, I didn't, who cares if I voted for Zelensky or not? I'm Ukrainian. It's not just, it's not just uh, crises like war that cause rallies. During COVID, um, we saw rallies as well. Uh, this is just a little thing from Vox, and it shows the first six, uh, kind of the change in approval during the first, I think, six weeks of the pandemic. Um, you see Trump gets a, a three-point bump. Abe loses three points. He had other things going on. He had to deal with the Olympics. Uh, didn't do well. Merkel goes crazy. Macron goes crazy. Australia, huge bump, and so forth. So one thing that we're interested in understanding with the current project we have is what, what's driving this. And we think there's something about the, the unifying rhetoric that a president presents under a crisis that really pumps up that patriotism quotient. Here's the United States' three biggest rallies. We have the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have Operation Desert Storm, and 9-11. And what I want to point out here is that rallies have different durations. And the theory on rally around the flag effects is that well, it's the emotions that give you the bump, and the patriotism gives you the bump, but something else explains the duration. And there's, at the beginning of, of any crisis, presidents have a monopoly on, or the leaders have a monopoly on the information. They're the ones who get the up-to-date in, intel, uh, and, and everybody has to kind of listen to them. Okay, they can dominate the narrative. And if, and if, the, if the numbers go up, and he becomes very popular, the opposition is very trepidatious. They don't want to step on their own toes. They don't want to say something stupid. And so they withhold their fire. But once more information comes out, they figure, okay, I can fire away. And that's what happens. And that's how rallies go away. Another thing that might drive economy, or might drive uh, approval is the economy. James Carville famously said it's the economy stupid when he was referring to um, getting uh, Bill Clinton reelected. But it turns out that the economy drives approval uh, in a lot of ways. I mentioned Gilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil, got impeached. This is just a graph showing uh, basically a consumer confidence index here, that red line. It just kind of maps super neatly with her presidential approval ratings uh, all the way until she, you know, she gets elected and then reelected and then she gets impeached. And these things just track uh, in an uncanny way. So it doesn't always happen that way. We have a sense that the economy is mattering less and less over time. And there's, we, we have a, a recent book on that. but. But it's still there, and it's still part of it. And it's be interesting in the United States to see uh, what, what happens now. Scandals will hurt you. This is a graph that I'm not going to try to get into, but it basically says that if, you have a, a, if the president is involved in a scandal, it's only going to hurt your popularity if the economy is doing poorly. So if unemployment is above 13%, it's probably going to systematically hurt your approval. Okay? Now, otherwise, if you're doing well, a scandal, you might just get away with it. This is in Latin America, maybe different in the U.S., maybe not. So the point of all of this is that executive popularities, regularities, make it easy to spot the anomalies. So if you just kind of know the basic, the basic curve, you can spot when something's going wrong, and that might point you to things that might be detrimental to your democracy. So if you have a very popular president, like we showed Bukele earlier, was at 91%. Well, that person may see themselves as invincible, and they may see themselves as above the Constitution, above the law. And in fact, we've seen that in Bukele, but he's not alone. Here's a picture. These are the approval ratings on the left of people who tried to um, extend term limits for the president. Okay, And a lot of Latin American countries had no re-election for reasons that uh, are historical. They didn't want people to stay around forever. And, uh, but so they made these laws, and then it turns out when presidents come in and get popular, the people on the right, these are the approval ratings of all the people who managed to extend uh, 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 term limits. And Bukele did just that, and, and here's his approval rating. You don't have to read Spanish to see that this is a lot of, of people that are agreeing that he is uh, doing his job well uh, in, in, in El Salvador. So... If you get too, if you get whoa, 
if you get too much popularity, you might get some institutional instability in a bad way, right? You might, you, you, you might get people entrenching themselves in power. Now, there's another way that you can under, use uh, the, the patterns of approval to understand, you know, maybe how democracy is going. And one is to think about if you, get, if you don't get a rally. So we showed Trump had a very small rally uh, under COVID. Well, he's not the only person. And where rallies are weak or non-existent, I take that as a signal, I think that is a bad sign. Uh, when there's an existential threat to the nation and not everybody comes together, that's strange. And so we actually have Brazil and, and Japan and the United States and a couple other countries where you don't get much of a rally at all. And I think that that hampers the ability of the president to make difficult decisions. And, and, a, and it also suggests that maybe even decisions that are made aren't necessarily going to be followed by the individuals here that didn't rally around the president that don't feel part of a collective, right? So it might hurt leaders' ability to act in a crisis. And, and here's, a, here's another, here's, here's, a, here's a recent rally that went, that never was, right? So Netanyahu gets attacked uh, from Hamas and there's, there's absolutely no rally. And so we'll see how this plays out, but it's possible that it might hurt uh, the collective action that, that is needed to, um, to kind of overcome this crisis in Israel. We kind of seen this graph before, and I want to show you that, I want to make the claim that if you see presidential approval or executive approval, if, if those cyclical dynamics are being muted, that might suggest you have an underlying problem in the electorate. So it could be things like polarized, when, when you, it suggests that opinion is polarized, okay? So what? Well, I think that's, that's, that, that's, that's problematic, and I'll tell you why. It could just be that, you know, partisanship is really strong, and that's a good thing. We like partisanship. It's good. We need it. But uh, it could mean other things. It could mean that, um, that, that, that Democrats and Republicans are judging leaders in, in, in ways that are totally dissimilar, or whatever party, you know, whatever country this can translate beyond. But you can see that in the old days, this, this gap between presidents, uh, I'm sorry, Republicans and Democrats approval of presidents, this is not new. There's always been a gap. Republicans have always liked Republican leaders better than, than Democratic leaders and vice versa. But the gap has grown totally enormous. Uh, and I'm sure if we did it today uh, under Biden, it would look very similar uh, to what it looked like under Trump. But it is, it is quite troubling. So what? I mean, well, it's also possible that it's changing the way people view facts. It might suggest that, there's, that you're, you're judging not the economy, but something else. Uh, and, and so here's just a look at um, consumer sentiment for Republicans. Uh, it was really good until Biden got elected, and then it went down. Same with Democrats. It was really low under Trump, and then Biden gets elected. All of a sudden, the economy is better. Did the economy change overnight? No, the leader did. So I find that a little troubling. This is just, I'm not going to go belabor the point, but basically people are, are not giving credit for the economy or for other performance indicators the same way as they used to. And I find that troubling. And the most troubling thing is the one that you can least have, a, you have the least chance of actually reading off of this graph. But this is from an interesting paper uh, that was just out uh, in the last year that basically shows that, when, that in older democracies, presidents are, being less, are less likely to be punished for democratic backsliding. What this is showing is the effect of, a president, of, of democratic backsliding on approval. And it doesn't have any effect in older democracies. It does have some good, a negative effect, which is good, in newer democracies. It suggests that newer democracies do a better job of holding leaders accountable to democratic norms. But in older democracies like ours and, uh, and elsewhere in Europe, perhaps, there is no effect. Democratic backsliding has no repercussions for the leader. So I'm going to wrap up here. I want, to, I want to again make my plea that approval ratings are the only thing you need to monitor. You guys are busy. You have a lot of things to keep, keep track of. If you have to keep track of one thing in politics, peek in on the approval rating. If popularity will follow a predictable pattern um, and you can kind of benchmark it across context, it should respond to national threats. It should respond to the economy. It should respond to uh, things that executives do in office, good or bad. And if it doesn't, you may have a problem. If you're deviating from these patterns, it could be an indicator, first of all, that you might have government instability. It might be that if you're in a country like Peru, the cabinet's going to reshuffle. Or if you're in uh, 
uh, you know, another country, maybe you're just going to kick out one minister, add a new one. No big deal. Or it could mean that the government's going to totally collapse if you're in a parliamentary system. In other places, the institutions themselves could be on very uh, poor footing. And a very popular uh, approval uh, a president or a very impopular approval president could, could, could usher in uh, a regime change or a big institutional change that you don't necessarily want. And the, the final point is that um, some of the things that we've observed about approval ratings when they're not going as they should suggest that there might be uh, some democratic ideals that aren't being met. The first one is responsiveness. You know, to what extent um, are presidents responsive to the public? You know, when all your co-partisans love you, then you can do anything you want. Trump said, I could go shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't matter, and he's probably right. Rival partisans who hate the president, if that's, what you, if that's what you got, if you have that graph that we just showed you, why would you ever work across the aisle? There's no incentive to be moderate. You can't impress them. You're never going to get them on your side. And so that kind of hurts. If you're somebody in the middle, in the middle of the distribution, you're the median voter, you, well, you're not going to be served, and nothing will get done. And finally, if a president isn't being punished or rewarded for things he or she does, or a prime minister isn't being punished or rewarded uh, for, for, for the policy actions they take, then... Um, then, then, then we're kind of forfeiting our own accountability mechanism we have as citizens. If we're not willing to, when Gallup calls us and asks us to take a, a, a survey, if we're not willing to tell it like it is, then the signal never gets there, and we might see people uh, get away with things they shouldn't, uh, including you know, bad behavior, but also undemocratic behavior. So that is my talk. Uh, thank you so much for your listening. I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, you've given us lots to think about. Uh, we do have 15 minutes uh, uh, for, for Q&A. Uh, we'd love to bring you into the discussion. Um, I hope it triggered some, some uh, questions and thoughts for you. If you do need to leave um, to get to a 1 p.m. class, uh, you're welcome to do so now. Um, once you do have a question, we have a microphone that we'll be delivering to you. Please wait for the microphone. Nate's in the back. He'll bring it to you. Uh, we invite you to uh, stand as you ask your question and uh, just tell us your name and if you're a student, what you study uh, here at BYU. Thanks. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Camille. Hi. And I'm studying bioinformatics. And I, I'm just wondering, from your research, have you found that approval ratings help or hinder in keeping presidents or prime ministers accountable during their own terms? Great question. And that, that goes to one of the, the main motivations of this research. We think that when, we like to think that presidents, well, we know that presidents care about their approval ratings. We know that prime ministers do. They poll every day. They're always looking. And so if they do something stupid or bad or poor or in bad judgment, and the, and the approval rating the next day is exactly the same, and a week later it's exactly the same, then we think that, that there isn't accountability. We think that accountability could be broken. Now, if we see changes after bad behavior or good behavior, then we think the accountability mechanism is intact. So sometimes we get that working. And, and, and my point is, like, if it's not, if, if that isn't working, then I think you've got a uh, a problem for democratic health on your hands. Um, so we like to think that, that that matters not only for elections are the ultimate act of accountability, you can always throw the bums out, as they call it, but in the meanwhile, what do you have? You got a midterm, some countries will have a midterm, not all countries. Uh, on the midterm, in the meanwhile, you just have approval ratings and you know that for a fact that leaders care deeply about those. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Yeah, hi, my name is Blake Jones, studying economics. I was curious if there's a scene, like a difference in what sort of crisis it is, whether it's whether you're the aggressor in a military intervention, you're the victim, whether domestic terrorism, how that kind of shakes up with the effect of the, their popularity. Great question, great question. There's a couple in there. Um, the one that I know most about is uh, domestic terrorism tends not to generate a rally very, uh, you know, systematically. And we think that that's because it doesn't threaten, it often doesn't threaten the entire nation. 
It's often localized. Um, sometimes you will get a small rally. It might not be very long. But the international ones, they really do. Now, um, being the aggressor or the victim, I think it's usually the victims that really feel the threat. Um, the aggressor may try to gen up support in the wake of a uh, of a um, of a um, of an uh, you know an attack or something, and sometimes they will get one. Um, but there's kind of less work done on that. There's actually some folk theory that sometimes presidents or prime ministers will seek war in order to bounce up their approval ratings. This is called the uh, uh, what do they call that? The um, diversionary war theory, is, uh, or sometimes they'll do saber rattling. They'll make so you, right now we have one going on in Venezuela. I don't know if anybody's paying attention, but Venezuela is threatening Guyana. Why? I don't know. But if we could, have, if we, if there were really good uh, polls in Venezuela, I'm sure they'd put Maduro support in the low twenties or the high teens. And he wants to be go toward a re-election, so he makes he makes gestures. So. Actually, the research on that is is not very convinced that that, that people actually actually take those uh, that leaders actually do those things, and when they do, it's unclear that they work. So, yeah, great question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Talis Barker. I'm studying mechanical engineering. I was just wondering if uh, there's any corollary data between uh, internal country uh, approval rating and uh, approval rating from external sources, like, uh, I don't know, the, the opinion of uh, world uh, leaders in other countries of that precedent, if there's corollary data there. So do you mean um, are, are presidents who are popular at home popular abroad? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. And... It's, please. Sorry. No, please, yeah. Uh, just... It, uh, how strictly that correlates. Um, yeah. yeah. That is a great question. And I know for a fact that there are many uh, international polling firms that will ask those questions. And I've never really seen that much work on it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. What you'll often see is, like, you're probably picking up on, I don't know if you have a world region in mind, but they'll often poll Latin Americans on, if, on whether they support you know, the president of the U.S., Chavez or some other leaders in Latin America, or they sometimes ask about China. Um, but I've never investigated that, but it'd be worth taking a look at, though. Good question. Hi, my, my question is kind of similar. Um, my name is Jenna, by the way. Hi. I'm studying geospatial intelligence. And so I was kind of wondering how you've seen um, like approval ratings and someone's time in office in Latin America and how that correlates to their relationship with the United States. Does that make sense? I don't know if I <laughs> worded that well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it, I think it can vary by country. I think Latin America, some Latin American countries will use the U.S. as this kind of external force to rally uh, support at home. Kind of, um, uh, there's a famous, um, Juan Perón was elected in the 40s by, uh, you know, basically saying that the opposing candidate was supported by the U.S. and, and he wasn't. And so th that brought him into power. Um, and you see Hugo Chavez and other leaders ra rail against the U.S. when, it, when they need to. Uh, and so there are other places, though, where uh, there is a, an incentive to cozy up to the U.S. And I don't know if that helps their approval ratings, but um, there are certainly places like Colombia are very much, uh, de de at least at one time, have been super dependent on our aid. Uh, and... Um, I don't know if that I don't know how it affects approval ratings, but that would be interesting because there is this great um, literature about the U.S. and Latin American relations, and 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 I don't know that anybody's really looked at at how those relations affect approval of, of leaders in a systematic way. Very interesting question. Hi, my name is Joanna, and I'm studying nursing here at BYU. Um, my question was regarding female presidents and um, approval ratings. I know you said that most female presidents who run for office, or at least that we've seen, um, are, hold, are held to a double standard where um, if it relates to crime or terrorism, that they may be more heavily punished mm -hmm. um, than a male president. How would you correlate that to our past um, election between Hillary Clinton and um, Donald Trump? 
Good question. Good question. I, um, so so our, our research is really about what they do in power, but I do feel like, and I'm not a, a, a student of this in the American context, but there is this kind of, they actually talk about it as a double bind, whereas women who show agentic traits often get termed nasty things. Um, starts with a B. Um, you know, but, but, but if, they, if, if they don't, then they're just seen as communal. So they're often put in a, in a, in a dilemma, right? Like, how do, I, how do I go head to head against a man? And so it's, it's, I don't know if that was at the heart of, her, of her, uh, that election, but that is something that we know from American politics when we, when we look at it, citizens' attitudes of voters uh, of different folks, that that is part of uh, the problem um, and part of the consideration. That doesn't mean women can't become president, but it does suggest that they do have this, um, this stereotype bind that they're in. If they go too manly, they get accused of, of being too aggressive. If they don't, they're, ah, oh, you're just a weakling on, on crime or something, right? So. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm studying advertising. Um, I kind of had a question to go along with that. Do you have any thoughts um, besides gender stereotyping of how to make a change in that um, double standard? I don't know how to change it, but I do believe that um, over time, the more women that do get into executive roles, uh, the better, right? This is going to go away. What you see if you go to parliamentary, and I think that maybe also parties could be part of the, the solution, and let me tell you why. Uh, in parliamentary systems where you have very strong parties, you get very popular women leaders. There's actually not much of a gender gap, and if anything, women leaders are actually a little stronger in parliamentary systems, and I think it's because they don't have to shoulder everything themselves as an individual directly elected candidate. They can rely on their party and their brand to kind of bring these other traits in and to bring these other policy, uh, uh, like expertise or policy that they own, you know, like, you know, you have the, the, eco, the eco people. Well, I support the ecology, you know, uh, I support the green movement, not because I'm a woman, because that's my party, right? So I don't have to take that on as myself. Um, so, so I think that stronger parties that I think they could actually help, uh, help break down this stuff. But where we've seen women presidents so far have been largely in places where parties are a lot weaker and, uh, and they are directly elected and they have to kind of speak for themselves. A prime minister becomes a prime minister when the, uh, the, the parliament votes him or her, the prime minister. They don't run themselves. So, so there's a different path. And I think that some of those gender stereotypes get filtered out by parties and, and parliamentary politics in a way that they don't in presidential systems. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm an American Studies major. Um, and I guess kind of along with that last question, you've also talked about polarization and how it can be bad for politics generally. Um, how do you recommend avoiding that on like an individual level and promoting depolarization as a community? That is the sixty-four million dollar question. We've we've hit on it, folks. And if I get this right, I get sixty-four million. So, <laughs> thank you, Quinn. And um, I don't know how to resolve it except for at a one-to-one -one level. You know, I think this is a university, a lot like my own undergraduate institution at Notre Dame, where you have people coming together from different points of view. You're eating together. You're talking together. You don't write each other off because you have a difference of opinion. And you just keep talking to each other. And don't let politics get personal. We've said it a million times. It's like the oldest cliche. But um, it, it has to start with us. That's, that's my non-scientific answer to a very personal and like big, also like, you know, world, worldwide phenomenon that, that, that's kind of tearing democracy apart, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great question. <laughs> Yes. My name is William. I'm double majoring in Asian studies and stats. And my question is, how do you reconcile the differences in wording between the questions that are being asked and the differences in meaning of like the word used for approval across languages? How long do you have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recognize. Yeah, no, this is great. Question. This is absolutely. Uh, I, I avoided even talking about this because it's so important, but it's, it's kind of a long answer. But you basically, uh, 
you have to admit that no one knows how to measure presidential approval. Okay? But everybody can get pretty close. And if you acknowledge that, then you say, okay, well, go take a survey of it, however you want to measure it. That survey is going to be a survey that's done. A survey is a snapshot of reality with error. Okay. The error comes from samples. It comes from the question. It comes from if you change out one word for approval for a different word. If you use, you know, so all of that is right. But if you look over time, if you take one, one company that asks the question in one way and see if another company who asks the question in another way if those things are varying over time, we can say that they're probably both tapping the same basic idea, which we can call presidential approval. And if you can use the magic of statistics, you can say, OK, let's see what that is, and let's use uh, um, some fancy statistics to create an average. So it's not like 538, where they just literally take an average. Almost, they weight it, and they do a bunch of fancy things, which is actually good. but we do something that tries to reconcile these things uh, by looking at, at estimating the best over time series. Now, are they going to be completely comparable across countries? Maybe not. In Brazil, they always, almost everybody asks the question with a middle category that says, very good, very bad, or regular. Well, regular is going to screw everything up, probably, right? But not in Brazil, because everybody's asking it that way. So, we have to do some, some statistical gymnastics when we compare cross-nationally, but that's okay. Uh, but that's a really good question, and um, no one really knows how to do it, but I think we're getting pretty close. Yeah, great question. I'm going to ask the last question. I'll, I'll just stand and ask it loudly. Uh, I know that Joe Biden's team is worried about his approval rating. Uh, if you were hired, by the team to help him get his approval rating up in the next six months. Uh, what are you going to do? What is, what's your advice? Thank you. Great question. Um, they are very worried about his team. Um, I try to tell myself to rely on the, the science, which says we don't know anything, we can't predict anything until we get 200 days out from the election. And even then, it's pretty bad. But we're almost 200 days out, and it's not looking very good. Um, I think you have to uh, change the narrative, and you have to talk about what you've, uh, what you've accomplished. Now, the Democrats aren't going to talk about that only. They're going to talk about abortion. They're going to try to scare people into voting for democracy as opposed to, you know, chaos. That's going to be their message. We know that. I think that uh, you, have to, you have to prosecute your case in favor of your own approval, uh, in favor of your own performance, and that is something that Joe Biden and even his surrogates are not doing. And uh, I think you also probably have to talk about what inflation means. Prices aren't going up. It doesn't mean, that, it doesn't mean they're not high. And they're not going down. They're not going down. They're, they're here. If they went down, that's an even bigger problem for the economy. You don't want deflation. So there has to be a, a discussion of what, what he's, what's, what's, who, why are you better off today than you were uh, when he came into office. And that is the part I'm not hearing. I'm hearing all kinds of other things about how he's not too old and how, oh, well, wait till, um, wait till we start talking about abortion and, and other kind of wedge issues. So I'm not hearing anything about uh, the movers and the shakers of, 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 of approval as we know it. Uh, now, campaigns have their own dynamics. And th the truth is, the, the research on campaigns isn't terribly uh, well established. You get little small blips, and no one really knows if you because you moved this part, this lever, or that lever. They're going to throw everything at it. But I think you got to talk about what you've done in office. So. Thank you.